Ah. Hi. Hello, Brian. Hello. How are you? I can't believe this works. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it, he's he's tripping out over modern technology, Brian. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, hey, I'm, I'm an old radio guy, right? Right. I'm an old radio guy, and I've done nothing but broadcast on radio since 1976, and and this Zoom oh. thing is all new to me. So, all right. Well, well it's, it's got picture. That's the only difference. Yeah. Right. Uh, let's get started with the interview. So let me do the official introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is a producer, a director, and a writer, and somebody who we consider to be cult film royalty. We are very excited to welcome the one and only Brian Usenet to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Brian. Hi, Terry and Tiffany. Hey, you're looking good. Um, I've done a lot of work here to make sure, like, the reflection isn't in my glasses. <laughs> See, the thing is, we talk to movie people like you, we don't know if you really look like that or it's all, uh, you know, special effects. Well, I'm, I'm behind the scenes, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. It's not the same. I'm not, I'm not a, in front of the camera guy. Yeah. Right. I'm I want, behind the camera right. guy. There you go. I want you to know uh, that we posted a marquee. Graham Skipper was, was talking about Stuart Gordon. We want to talk about Stuart for a minute. But uh, actress Kelly Maroney said to tell you that Brian is awesome. <laughs> well, she is. She's awesome. Absolutely. I I will never forget when I, what was the name of that movie that she was, was it called Night of the Comet? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that was I don't know. There's something about the 80s, you know, that video, those independent video movies. Yeah. That, I don't know. I remember seeing that movie and just thinking it was like, wow, this is great, you know. So I take it you've never worked with Kelly Maroney, right? I haven't, but I'd like to. Yeah. I'd like to. Yeah. Well, she's probably watching right now going, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you because... If I ever make another movie, you know. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> you will. It's not if, it's when. Hey, you know, you got you to gotta look, look the beast in the eye. I was interviewing John Waters one time and I was talking about your next movie. He's like, next movie? I don't know if I'm going to make another movie. I'm like, you're John Waters. He's like, well, I'm not Fellini. So, you know, <laughs> it's not easy. Well, of, co of course. You know, he, even Altman, I remember reading about Altman. Mm -hmm. um, and when he was, I, I guess it was in the 80s, right, when he made he made a bunch of lesser movies, or what we would say, not his great movies. But he said, you know, it's amazing. It never gets easy. Yeah. That's it's always sure. tough, mm -hmm. you know. And I think for him, you'd think, God, he made MASH, and he made, you know, Nashville, and he yeah. made all these great movies, and it's still tough, you know? Right. Well, I wanted to mention, because, of course, you're known a lot for working with Stuart Gordon, and uh, I think it was Friday right. was his birthday, and I believe it was just a year ago that we lost Stuart. Can you talk a little bit about your friendship with Stuart and what it was like working for him? Well, you know, it's um, coincidentally... A week ago was the memorial for Stewart yeah. at the Descanso Gardens in Pasadena or Altadena or whether that was. And um, because it couldn't happen when he died, which was a year almost and a half ago. Right. And so it was quite a big gathering and um, Kind of very emotional, even though it was so much later. You know, you know, a, a memorial a week or two after someone's passing is, um, is the emotions are really on the surface. But a year and a half later, it's different. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's been a long time, but it's amazing how um, emotional it was and. How many different um, people from different parts of his life were there, and how many people I hadn't seen in so long? Right. Um, it's uh, it's hey, we get old and we die, you know. 
and hopefully we don't get sick beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> That's the tough part. But, um, you know, he was a big, I learned so much from him. You know, he was a, a big part of my life, um, especially in the 80s yeah. and into the 90s. And so many movies that I did, he was involved in. The, you know, I learned to make movies. I'm like, I, people today, they go to school to learn. And I think that's a good idea because, not because you're going to learn better at school and in the universities and all that, the film school, but because you, you meet the people that hopefully are going to be part of your professional career. That's the really important part of film school, I think. The otherwise, you might as well take your money and the money you spend on film school and make a movie. You'll learn everything by making a movie, but you won't make all the connections that maybe are going to help you down the line. I never went to film school. I never took a class. I, wow. You know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an itinerant <laughs> filmmaker, and I didn't even start making movies till I was in my 30s. That's, that's the crazy thing, right? Because I grew up in the 60s, and so, you know, when Timothy Leary said, turn on, tune in, and drop out, <laughs> I did it. Yeah. I did that, you know. But then it turned out the revolution didn't happen. Yeah. And you had to make a living. You had to actually, and eventually, you know, I was making a living, and I ended up with a Bolex movie camera, and I just got really into it. And then I... I put an ad in Variety saying I needed a horror movie director. And eventually all this evolved to me meeting Stuart and making Reanimator, yeah. which I basically bet my whole future on. Because I took everything I had, borrowed money, and I made that movie like an idiot because I was in my 30s. <laughs> and everybody in the... I think until you're 35, you're actually not an adult. Right, right. right. I think that is isn't that true? I think so, it's yeah. Like 35 is when you actually come of age. Yeah, 35, Forget you're that like... that 21 stuff. Yeah, That's 30, baloney. 35, you're like, oh, I should probably get my shit together. <laughs> I, think, I, I, think there's, I think there's something about the brain development or something, you know. Hey, you can't be president till you're 35. Right. You know? <laughs> right. I, I don't, I'm not sure. You might not even be able to be a senator. So it's not a, it's not a made up thing, but I, but when I was in my early 30s, I came out to LA and luckily I ended up meeting Stewart who was in Chicago and he had already had a career, about a 10 year career directing theater mm -hmm. and was quite accomplished and he liked horror and he liked to shock people and we got along great and we dove into reanimator and luckily what i bet everything on had stuart directing and they ba and basically i kind of learned i kind of learned a lot of directing from stuart just by watching him and honestly i've I've probably produced, I forget the number, but like 10 at least first-time directors, yeah. maybe more. And you, you know, that's a kind of whole experience. Stuart was a first-time director. Isn't that incredible? But, I mean, wow, that's, that's amazing. But the thing is, he was an experienced, Theater director. Yeah, there you go. And I think that's kind of what threw Reanimator over the top was that we're not used to seeing a cheap horror movie yeah. with such accomplished professional direction. And Stuart loved to shock people, which is kind of what horror is about, yeah. right? He was yeah, really he, he was really good at uh, attracting great people too because the, the cast involved with Reanimator just well, was incredible. I was gonna say, I mean, do you think with Stewart being a first time film director, although he had experience in theater, that it helped 
with having your star, Jeffrey Combs, who was a theatrically trained actor. I mean, he was no slouch when it came to theater direction either. Well, I think that I think that Stewart knew how to. He um, he had a criteria for actors. He knew how to deal with actors. He'd been doing it for ten years by that time. He was the artistic director of the organic, organic theater in Chicago, and I went to Chicago and saw his plays, and then met. Then we made the deal to do a movie, yeah. actually three movies, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that he um, it was yes he, he 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 the actors in Reanimator were unknown. They were, you know, in Hollywood, they're just nobodies. But with a director like, a, a, an accomplished director like Stewart, he could, you know, he can take a an amateur and make them perform in a way that is credible. Right. So you're dealing with somebody with really great, um, you know, he had his chops with the actors, but... He, he also, you know, his, I think one of his formative experiences was, um, when he was in college at the University of Wisconsin, he did a version of, of, um, of Peter Pan. And I guess it had something to do with LSD or something. <laughs> and everybody ended up, everybody ended up naked on stage. Wow. And he got arrested. And booked. <laughs> I've seen the I've seen the article with a picture of him, mm -hmm. and I think that I feel you know Stuart and I are almost the same age. We grew up in the late you know we came of age in the late sixties. It was the wild in the streets era. Right. Yeah, it yeah. was you know it was you know drug sex and rock and roll right. and turn on to an end drop out. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot about like it was there was this generational kind of thing. And um, and I think Stewart, he shocked people, and I think he liked it. I think he liked to shock people, yeah. and I think he kept wanting to. And with horror, that's a good thing. Yeah. And yeah. so when I first met him, when we first talked about Reanimator, I said, you know what? My experience, I have no experience. I, you know, I'm an, I'm an amateur. You know, uh, I've never, I haven't been trained at all. I just have books back then, pre internet. You just read books about right. it. And, but I love the process. And I said, you know, one thing I've, I'm a horror fan, you know, and quite frankly, Dennis Paoli, the Stewart's co writer on, on Reanimator, has told me, he says, you know what, me and Stuart, we did every kind of thing. He's Stuart's friend from like high school. Right. And he said, but you wanted to do horror. So we did horror because they can do that too. I'm a horror fan. I, when I was going to make a movie, I wanted to make a horror movie. Well, it's quite and clear you can, and when, it's quite pardon? clear you, it's quite clear you can do everything. Uh, much like Stewart, because I think it's interesting you mentioned he did a production of Peter Pan, because I always find it humorous whenever horror people dwells into making children's programming. You went from Reanimator to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. <laughs> now, that's a stretch, but I've got to know, since you are a horror guy, did you really have an urge to slip a severed head in a Disney movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No? No, you know what? Well, I think what a lot of people don't um, understand is that horror and fantasy are kind of two sides of the same coin. Yes, they are. If you take Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and you lower the key lighting, and you put a bad ending to it, it's a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. That is true. You know, it's yes. not, I mean, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, it sounds like an exaggeration, but not really. If you think of any kind of fantasy movie, it can go to the family kind of friendly part, or it can go dark. Right. And so I don't think that's such a, I mean, I was always, and when we, when we, it, we, when we came up with the idea for honey, um, it was actually here in this house. We were having a barbecue and it was 
let's make a movie that our kids can visit the set on. <laughs> <laughs> we both, we both, we're both family men. I mean, yeah, yeah. Stuart and I are like really traditional kind of one wife, kids. I got four kids. He's got three kids. We, we were, did a lot of social stuff together and it were, we're about our kids, you know. And then you think, but we love horror. Yeah. <laughs> and really, the kids shouldn't see that stuff, right? Well, but I, I we, both, we both love those old Disney Fred McMurray movies. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. The yeah. Dog yeah. and The Flubber yeah. and all that. And that's what we said. When we came up with the movie at a, bar, a barbecue in my backyard, <laughs> we said, you know, this should be a Disney movie. And it should have Fred McMurray in it. <laughs> because, you know, people, you make movies about the movies you love. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's, we, the, the language of film is film. Not that anybody uses film anymore. So it's kind of a retro, um, kind of label, but it's, we can't make, we always, come from our childhood. Up. Right, that's for sure. Absolutely. Well, you come from the Philippines, and that's a, a great place. You wouldn't think of the Philippines as a place that makes movies, but they do. And there was a great movie franchise in the Philippines called Blood Island, and I love anything that came from over there. Like, one of my favorite films is Make Them Die Slowly and movies like that. And I want to find out, because you got something going on, you've got a Kickstarter campaign going on right now, and you're wanting to bring this franchise to light into a modern-day age and tie it in with some product. Talk about what you're doing with, with Blood Island to where you're going to be coming out with a graphic comic book that may wind up turning into a movie, how people can make this possible. Well, um, this, is ba this is actually the project of my friend David Searing. Mm -hmm. Now, David Searing, his, he had a whole career at AMC and was actually had his own cable channel in the mid-2000s called Monsters HD. You know something? I, I, I just got to tell you that, that I was a subscriber to Boom. It was a satellite service that had Boom, always, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I loved it when it went away because the whole service went down. Uh, they wound up selling their satellite to... Uh, 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 I think it was DirecTV. DirecTV Somebody, or one of those. Yeah. Uh, uh, sling. They sold to oh, sling. sling. There you go. Sling. But I loved Monsters HD. It was, and the quality was so perfect. It was so cool to know your partner was responsible for that. I guess he's also involved with uh, with Shudder, too, right? Well, I mean, AMC owns Shudder. Yeah. And so I'm not sure you would have to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Because I do think that he was involved in setting up Shutter. Yeah. But he's he's a guy who worked in the corporate world. I met him because he licensed a couple movies from me and and put them in HD mm -hmm. um, for Monsters Day. He's just a geek. He's just a, <laughs> he's a super fan of of genre stuff. Right. You know. And now he's, I think his company's name is Drive In Sanity. Mm. You know? And he actually, he actually puts movies up in, at Drive In. He's in Pennsylvania, oh, back wow. on the East Coast. Very good. So, I mean, he's like, he's like the real deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he knows all these old movies. He, he's been dealing with a guy named Sam Sherman who owns all these, has a whole big library of these B-movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And part of his library is the Blood Island movies. There's four of them. Right. And David loves these movies. <laughs> and he got the, he got the rights to them for sequels, remakes, all this kind of stuff. I, he's also handling, there's like a 70 movie yeah. special edition wow. that, that's being put out. Wow. But, so he wanted to, to do a, I, I guess a reboot or a kind of reimagination of it. And I, I'm on board, of course. And these movies take place, of course, they were shot in Philippines. Mm -hmm. Now I, worked 
and lived in Indonesia for three years trying to make movies there. And one of the things that really kind of attracted me was that the the kind of mythologies and the monsters in their mythologies in, in Indonesia, and I would add, add Malaysia, um, Philippines, that whole Southeast Asian area, they all have these kind that there's a similar mythology. Yeah. And we're so used to the horror movies based on European and mainly Eastern European mythologies that interpreted through through Western European, you know, the Draculas, the vampires and werewolves and, you know, eating the dead and these kind of, um, it's been done to death, of course, you know, and, um, but in Indonesia, they have all kinds of crazy creatures. And so the thing about the Blood Island was it entered, it kind of opens the door to that. Right. And so David has kind of, he, he co-wrote the script and it's kind of either two movies or a mini series. Every 15 minutes, there's another really crazy creature. I mean, really great stuff. And because that was not only because I, hey, he's my friend, I'll, support his project in any way. But more than that, this was the kind of stuff I wanted to do in Indonesia before the Great Recession happened. I did only two movies there. But there were so many stories to do in Indonesia. And I always had this idea that you could you could take these these kind of legends or myths or whatever you call horror or ghost story type stuff and Kind of bring them out to the to the world audience in the same way that the Japanese have been quite successful with J horror yeah. and a right. lot of the Japanese ghost movies. Yeah, the Ring. That we, we, yeah, the Ring. Yeah, the Ring. Who all those actually J horror was created by a partner of mine. And I don't know if you know a movie I did called Necronomicon. Yes. Yes. And that movie. That movie was, uh, there was a Japanese co-producer on it called, uh, named Take Chise. Uh-huh. And he's the guy who created The Ring, The Grudge, Dark Waters, all of those things, right? Uh-huh. But he, but these are, that's a kind of a Japanese sensibility. But then you also have more older Japanese ghost movies and you know, you watch these things, you go, wow, they have different rules from us, just like, just like the Thai movies. You will watch Thai horror movies, Thailand horror movies, and you go, wow, they, vampires are different. You know? <laughs> they are. They have a different, sure. you know, there's a different kind of story structure. Mm-hmm. And Koreans, wow, the, some of the Korean stuff is great. We're talking about Southeast Asian, which is kind of like, more of the, the South, South Pacific. And I think it's fascinating, but what I love about the Blood Island movies is just shamelessly exploitative. <laughs> that kind of appeals to me. And I would know? assume very I, I remember I told David, I said, I'll, I'll help you in any way you want, yeah. but please make it on a budget that you don't have to make it mainstream. Right, right. <laughs> He's got, I'm telling you, there's more weird creatures in Tales of Blood Island than you can imagine. Now, and when, I'm, I'm all about that. When we're talking about creatures, what kind of creatures are they? I mean, what are they headhunters? Are they vampires? Like, it's, it's like, well, of course, there's the main beast of Blood Island, which yeah. pulls its head off it. It was Dr. Lorca, and he and he found a sap from a tree. It just happens to be Reanimator Green. Oh, okay. Well, of course, yeah. Reanimator by predating Reanimator by about twenty years, right. Now, right? But it's like this green sap that brings things back to life, and the head's alive, 
you know, the beast pulls his head off, his head, but then there's tree zombies, and there's the, 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 the kind of evil, the kind of cannibal mermaid type characters, and there's, um, you know, pygmy monsters, and two-headed snakes, and, and heads that fly around with their <laughs> lungs attached. And, I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. You know, it's just bizarre. And to me, I don't know. That kind of, I just like that kind of stuff. I, I like, I want to see the pygmy monsters, except when they come after you, you can just boot them out of the way. You know, just, you know. Now, let me ask you, Brian, uh, if it gets to gets to the stage of filming, um, and, and you, you obviously are involved in all of that kind of stuff, knowing that there is still a love in the genre for going old school, what about effects? Are you guys going to go practical, or are you guys going to go CGI or a mixture? Well, I would, I, I would always go practical. I don't, I mean, I, I, um, you know, the thing about CGI is one, unless you have a tremendous amount of money, it's not very good. It's yeah, true. Absolutely. Yeah. And secondly, CGI is basically animation. It's a very sophisticated animation. And when we're watching these Marvel movies and stuff, we're basically watching very high quality animated features. Or a video now, game. I, huh? Or a video game. It looks well, like a video game. Well, video games have a very, they have a lesser quality yeah. animation and they're interactive. But one thing I've noticed with CGI effects and, and, I only did one movie that actually had much CGI effect. It was called Amphibious, and I did it in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And I had the experience of seeing how, what the layers of making a CGI creature are. And one of the problems of it is, is you're budgeted to have a certain amount of time with each layer of effects technician or artist. And when they, once you make your animatic and you start going to the next levels, which is giving it a body and giving it skin and putting the lighting, putting the, the atmosphere, and, you know, there's, you can't change what you decided along at the beginning. Right. Unless you're in a huge movie, right? Right. In a huge, like $180 million movie. You can say, get rid of that, let's do it again. Mm -hmm. But if you're dealing with a budget, you can't, you, you're just stuck with it. And they have so many seconds that you can do shots. And the shots are often like, um, you know, three quarters of a second, a second and a half, two seconds. And so uh, the movie I was doing was a giant sea sport. And we built a 40 meter, a 40 foot sea scorpion, but they don't do much. It takes 12 people to make it do anything. Right, yeah. right. So then, so there's certain shots you've got to have it be digital. Yeah. And when I would deal with the, the artists, they, they would say, well, we've only got so many seconds, so many <laughs> like tenths of a second. And they'd say, I'd say, well, it should do this, you know? And they'd say, well, we can have it jump over to the other side and back. It's the same thought. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say, yeah, but that, it, you know, in terms of gravity, I'm not sure that really works. But, and then I realized that's why all these digital creatures, they do all kinds of shit. There's no, there's no <laughs> gravity to it. <laughs> Why? Because you're budgeted for this very small piece of time, and you can have it do more. So for my purposes, I would prefer to have a puppet. Yeah, for right. sure. Yes. A puppet a puppet has life. Yeah. I know effects guys who can put their hands into a sock and bring it to life. For I mean, sure. you can stand Absolutely. there with it. They can put their hands in a sock. And they will make it 
see something. Effects, tech, uh, effects artists are in the actor skill. They're in the screen actor. Wow. Right? Why? Because they're performing. Yeah. They're performing. Yeah. A guy in a suit or somebody in society underneath the big shunting, uh -huh. there was like a dozen people under the shunting with little terrible little black and white video monitors trying to make it work. They're, they're performing. And if you have a puppet, you can shoot it from different angles. Right. You can have them do it again and again. You can put some smoke in there. You can put blinking lights. You can put some goop on it. And you can keep fooling around with it until something works. Right. But with digital, no. You do the animatronic, yeah. which is almost like a stick figure. Yeah. You put the flesh on it. You put the skin on it. You light the set, but once you decide on the movement of your animatronic, you're never, you're never doing it again. Well, and we're all on a low budget. We're all for old school. That, that's for sure. Old school is the best. The only thing with digital is a lot of times it does look, it looks better with creatures, it seems, and with other things. So sometimes it works, but there's nothing like old school. So there's I'm nothing glad like old well, school. Well, no, I mean, I mean, look at J Jurassic Park. Yeah. I mean, come on, even back then, that was. Pretty damn good. Yeah. But yeah. that's the high end. That's the high end. And the kind of movies I make, of course, unfortunately, <laughs> are kind of on the low end. And you don't, I mean, I was still cutting on film well into the 2000s. You know? I, I was, I, I think I've only made probably a couple movies that were shot on digital cameras. I shot right. film way into the 2000s. Why? Because it was still cheaper. Right. Because you're looking at a budget, you know. So it's not, it's, I think, and also, I think digital is great. I think CGI is fantastic to augment, to add stuff. Yes. So when I have no, my that, big that's secret right there. scorpion, yeah. I can't make the mouth and the eyes look good in puppetry. Right. But I can add it to the digital. Right. I can, you can take a rubber effect and then augment it digitally and it really works. Yeah. Now, if you're going to start throwing blood up on the wall and making that digital, which is what they do these days, I'm yawning. I'm bored. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you want to cut somebody's head off, please. Get a rubber head and cut the rubber head off. Now, you know? we're, we're looking I mean, forward to this movie. <laughs> but before we see the movie, we're going to see this whole thing serialized in a graphic comic book. Tell us about how that's going to happen and then evolve into the movie. How does this whole thing work? Well, you know, the thing about, about, um, about movie screenplay is that nobody reads them. The people who read them, the only people who read them are generally paid to do it. Right, right. <laughs> and, they, yeah. and they write a, a report on it. The people who make them, anybody of any, any kind of level never read the script. Now, of course, if you're Quentin Tarantino and you deliver a script, the boss is going to read it. But unless you're somebody on that level, Nobody, the people who read it are just paid their reader right. and they do a report. So you've got to, then you need to have your presentation, your deck, what they call a deck, you know, with the visuals and you want something that's kind of digestible in five or ten minutes to present it. And, um, and, and storyboards, they, you still do storyboards, right? Well, that's the thing. A comic book is better than storyboard. Oh, yeah. That is true. So one way to do it is to try to go to other other um, media. And the thing about a comic book is you can do, you can make your idea into a comic book or a graphic novel. Generally, four, four issues of comic book is a graphic novel, right? It's like 22 pages each or somewhere around there, 
the graphic novel will be eight, 90 pages or something. But if you have a comic book, then you get what the movie is. And it doesn't take much effort. And a comic book is a finished product. It is something of its own, which also gives the writer and the producer, uh, David Searing in this case, kind of a sense that, of something real. A, a movie script is like like a blueprint for a house. You, you want to look at the blueprint or you want to see a representation of the house. Right. I think that what it, it's a very good for saying, hey, this is what it's going to be like. This is what we're talking about. And luckily, David Searing got a, an amazing artist, Stephen Cicilli, wow. who I didn't know him before this project, but he's like, he just has a style, a drawing style, so in kind of in focus with this project, this kind of kind of jungle tiki horror kind of stuff. And he's a great, I think with art, with, with visual arts, I, I admire the most someone who can draw. Yeah. And most of the comic books today, of course, I'm, I still have like chests full of comic books in my garage <laughs> from a long time ago, right? But so many of the comic books I see today, I don't know. They, they seem so digital. They're yeah. so, the color palette, the draw, it all, I don't know. It's very, uh, it doesn't have a lot of guts to it. Not like the, uh, the old the EC season. comics, the old, you know, Tales Pardon? from the Crypt. The old EC comics are what I love. The, the old, uh, Tales from the Crypt. Oh, way thing. back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, way back. Well, I, I, when I had my allowance way, way back then, <laughs> I used to buy those things. Yeah. I mean, that was part, that was the first horror yeah. I ever saw, was those horror comic books. Yeah. But the thing about Stephen Castilli, his drawing style was fantastic. When we started drawing pages of the script in comic, I said, hey, that's how you, sh that's how you direct it. Right. That's how you shoot it. And I've always worked Generally, as much as I could, I've always worked with with artists, visual artists. So, for example, with Society, Screaming Mad George was a major collaborator in kind of developing the you know, shunting. On um, you know, when I went to Spain, I met Richard Rapports, who directed Frankenstein's Army, yeah. and he. He did storyboards for me, but they were more than storyboards. He, he kind of, um, you know, I, I tend to go for, I tend to be attracted to, to inspiration to people who, who have a vision. And then I back engineer it into a movie because I'm kind of a, you know, my basic, I'm kind of a producer type, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I want to make it into a project. You know, I've got a project. But I've got to get that, get something fantastic out of it. And you kind of want to draw it out of people, you know, and, and get ideas. And if you love the idea, then you try to figure out a way to figure it into the movie. Yeah. You know, but I think Stephen Sestilly, he took the script that, with, that David Searing, um, co-wrote. And man, from the beginning, there's, the stuff he was drawing, I was going, wow, well, we don't, it's not a storyboard, it's a comic, mm -hmm. but you can see how to tell that story. And hopefully, well, I think the comic is going to be a, it's going to be great on its own. And all these swag and the merchandising that they're doing. And I mean, this Kickstarter stuff, man, it's like a full-time job. I mean, so you're, you're used to free. working... It ain't free money. Let me no, tell you that. Uh, you're used to working from a script, and, and uh, of course, there's storyboards when you make a movie. So you literally will have the comic book, too, 
to go on. How much is that comic book going to influence you when you actually make the movie? Because it's a different well, process. We, you know, we haven't seen the whole comic. We've only seen a bit of it. I've only worked with Stephen Sestelli a little. But I'm telling you, I mean, we're back and forth, so it's not like, I mean, he drew it after we talked. I mean, with David Searing and, and all that. So it's not like it's not, you know, but his, but his, his attitude towards it, his approach is kind of so in tune with the tiki horror, blood island, because this is a, this is a period piece. Right. Takes place in the 60s, right? So we're not, we're, this is like Indiana Jones or something, you know, how it, it's retro. Right. It's not today. Yeah. Right. And it's not in any, it's like a tiki bar is in no real, there's never been a tiki bar except in the U.S., right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like Disneyland. It's yeah. a fantasy type of idea of a bamboo bar, <laughs> my, my ties and stuff, you well, know. Well, and it's my, it's, it is, go ahead. I was going to say, it's my understanding, though, that this wouldn't be the first time that you're kind of creating something from illustrations. Uh, weren't you the first person to adapt a, a manga into a into a, a, oh, a yeah. whole film? That was the Giver, right? Believe it or not. Wow. Hey, who could guess? Right? Very similar. No, the Giver, I think the Giver was the actual first anime and manga Adapt and like reinterpreted as a live action Hollywood movie. <laughs> but at that time, I was dealing, I was working with the Japanese a lot. Um, I, the society and Bride of Reanimator were both financed by Japanese money. Oh. And I, and, and, and I also, then I ended up working with Takei Chisei, who is the creator of J Horror. But he wasn't involved with Diver or any of those. But so I was quite, and then I did Crying Freeman, which probably was the second. Now, it's never been released in the U.S. because of some screwy kind of um, conflict between the, the, one of the, the financers and the U.S. distributor. But it was quite big in Europe. And, yeah. Crime Freeman is a fantastic movie. It was the, really the first, I think it was the first um, feature film by Christoph Gans, who did the first episode of Necronomicon. And now he's a, a huge um, French director. Right. But yes, I, I um, Guy Burr was based on the anime and the, um, and the manga. And I'm very visually oriented. Right. And I absolutely, um, you know, I am so interested in visual artists. So when I make movies, I'm always looking for, you know, I'm not the, I wouldn't say I am, you know, today there's this idea, you know, it's kind of like when Bob Dylan came along in the 60s. Mm-hmm. He was like the first singer-songwriter. Before that, people played a song and sang it, the folk crowd and all that. Frank Sinatra, nobody ever thought he should write his songs. Elvis Presley, nobody ever thought. (laughs) Bob Dylan came along and became a mega artist. Yes, yeah. He was a singer songwriter. Now everybody has to be a singer-songwriter. Even though they actually uh, the the ugly truth is that there's still like a handful of songwriters who are pitching their songs to all these huge acts today. Right. But then just like directors today, Hitchcock was very involved in how he Developed his movie. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I know that 
personally because I worked with Joe Stefano. Oh, who wrote, really? Um, Psycho. Yeah. I worked with him on a movie that he had written that we were going to produce that never got made. Oh, such a fan and of his. He told me, kind of took me through the, his experience with Hitchcock. And I also um, came in contact with Jay Press and Allen, who wrote, I think, Torn Curtain. Hitchcock was very involved with his scripts, yeah. but he never put his name on it. Yeah. Never put his name on it. Today, every director puts his name on the script because he developed it. Right. And that's, today, every director is an artist. It could be his first movie. It could be his first short <laughs> yeah. student film. And he's an artist. Already. It's, un it's unfortunate right. because it's kind of like we feel like people are artists before they're craftsmen. Yeah. Artists are all kinds think that, I think we're losing something there. Yeah, I think for sure. there's an idea. You know, you think that you should, you should master a craft before it elevates. To an art artistic level, or maybe that doesn't matter whatsoever. It's just a merchandising, a commercial kind of way to sell things. And, and you know, so the, today the, every. I was just going to say the merchandising thing is so great because what you're doing with Blood Island is old school and the fact, of course, there's the comic book and then there's the movie. But we want to talk about the merchandising now. We talked about tiki's and and you know the island and this and that. How does a mug? come into play with Blood Island and describe what it is and, and how do people get this? I mean, how does this whole thing work with Kickstarter? Well, you know, the thing is, is you probably should really be talking to David Searing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because he he is a he's a cheeky guy. Yeah. You know, he just he just has an appreciation. It was a subculture I never knew about. Until, I mean, I knew about the mythology right. of, of Southeast Asia because I lived there. Yeah. But what I didn't understand, but he made, when he got the rights to the, to the Blood Island movies, the four movies, I think, there's uh, Terror is a Man, which is less of it, but then it's like the Beast of Blood Island and Rise of Blood Island. <laughs> but they are, but he's really into that. So if I, he ever came, when he, he's in, he's in Pennsylvania. When he'd come out here, we'd always go to a tiki bar. Oh, there you, you know, go. They were, it was Trader Vic's. Yeah. That, that kind of was the big one in the right. 50s and 60s. I think it, it's such a fake. Disneyland version of Southeast <laughs> Asia. I think it happened because there was a bunch of GIs in World War II that were, that came back from the, the ones who were in the Pacific theater, not the, not the European theater. And they came back and they knew the tropics. And they, and so you would make a bar and put bamboo you know, yeah. a bamboo bar, and then these kind of rum drinks, right? right? Mai Tai or something, right? And and put kind of, it's kind of a fake thing, really. But it's there's a huge subculture for it. So I think just a couple of weeks ago, there was a whole tiki convention down in Long Beach or somewhere amazing. in SoCal. And, and there's, I never do this, but there is a huge market in, um, in these tiki mugs. And where we, uh, if you've seen the Kickstarter video mm -hmm. that I'm the pitch man for, which I really dug. I really, first time I was the pitch man, right? <laughs> but I really dug it because you don't have to worry about getting the equipment there getting the lights, making sure everything's set up. You just go in and pitch. Right. That's, that's the back porch of a house in the valley here in L.A. 
Uh, where are you guys located, by the way? We're we're in Los Angeles. We're actually up in the okay. Angeles, the Angeles National Forest. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's yeah. nice. <laughs> Where are where up there? We live in Lake Hughes. Uh, so you go Lake up the... If Lake Hughes. Yeah. So uh, if you're in Santa Clarita, you go up the canyon into the forest for about 25 minutes. That's where we're at. It looks like Camp Crystal Lake up here, like from uh, Friday the 13th. Yeah. <laughs> So there, there's actually a lake. Well, there was. There, it, it dried up. Well, there was, but oh. unfortunately, because we're in California, there's also huge fires like yeah. every year. So they ended right. up using the, the lakes to put out the fire, and now the lake is kind of dry. Yeah. But there was lakes. Well, I, I used to drive up the Angeles Crest Highway up yeah. to Mount Wilson with my kids all the time yeah. on Sunday. I love that area. I love it up there. But anyway. Well, we'll have, to, we'll have so to show your Kickstarter so video. Cow. We'll have to show your Kickstarter video on the show here later on and, and see what you're talking about with this, this porch thing. But that was fun doing that video, huh? Well, that's somebody's house. That is, when you look at that, it looks like a bar, right? <laughs> yeah. It's somebody's house in like a casino <laughs> or something. Yeah. And I, I couldn't believe it. I walked out there and... They turned their their porch and their backyard into a tiki bar, yeah. and the whole house, every wall is full of tiki mugs. So, and and there's all these like famous ones and ones from certain famous tiki bars. You wouldn't believe it. There's actually there's actually a reanimator tiki mug, really? which is a Dr. Hill head. Oh God, <laughs> I want that so bad. So what? What is your but tiki mug? David, Go ahead. Pardon? I was just going to say, what so is David Siri your... made a tiki mug uh -huh. for the beast of blood that had a head that comes off? There right? you go. You, you drink the beast. Now <laughs> I'm not sure how these tiki mugs. They're like, in, I mean, these are ceramic mugs that are that are fire. Yeah. Inside, they're very. It's not like it's like a glass cylinder. So I'm not sure anybody ever drinks out of them. If you did, you'd have to drink out of one, out of a straw. Any true collector, collect that has, any true collector that has something they like that does not want to drink out of it. Right. They, Keep it for they collect them. And I really want to do a butthead society tiki mark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just wanted to let people know uh, who are listening, if you're interested in uh, participating and supporting the Kickstarter campaign, uh, the campaign is actually called Brian Usna's Blood Island Jungle Horror Comics and Tiki Mugs. It's a mouthful. So just if you go over to Kickstarter and search Blood Island or Brian Usna, it should come right up. And there's a whole list of, uh, of uh, rewards and perks that you can get for uh, contributing to the Kickstarter campaign, uh, including a copy of the comic book that's coming out, uh, the Tiki Mug itself, all of those kinds of things. So check it out. Uh, the the Kickstarter's going for another 29 days. And you guys are doing pretty good, Brian. I mean, you've already kind of have reached close to what you wanted to or maybe a little over. So there it's you doing go. pretty good. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, I, just... think, I think every, everything is, I think it's good value for money. I'm telling you, this Kickstarter, I've never done it before. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that Stuart Gordon and Jeffrey Combs did it a few years ago for uh -huh. the, um, they were trying to make a, a, a Edgar Allan Poe movie. Right. right. And they were, I think they were trying to get, like, the full budget, right? Yeah. And I thought they did a good job. And that Stuart, uh, the thing about Kickstarter, if you don't meet your meet your goal, you get nothing, right? right? So right. you got to make sure you're careful about that. But Stewart was not very, you know, he felt like, I, I remember when I talked, I said, well, what did you think about it? He said, I don't know, it's kind of like standing on the corner with your hat in your head. <laughs> and it didn't seem very attractive to me. Right. And when I see what David and his team are doing, in a way, it's really... I mean, it's a full-time job. I don't feel like, I, I feel like it's value for money. And quite frankly, I think that um, the value of it 
for the amount of money you're raising, really the value of it is actually, it's kind of like getting people who might be interested connected. So there's a, it's really more about promotion than right. it is about, about, it's not money for free, I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Absolutely. Right. The work that's involved, and thank God I'm not having to do the fulfillment. <laughs> and the comic is going to be great. I mean, I, I buy, you know, I, I support my friend, uh, Pivon Shelley with his, his books yeah. on Kickstarter. And I'm just, it, I've worked with him, you know, with the story, you know, I've worked with him, I've known him for years. And he's a real artist, and he gets to actually kind of keep going with his art without having to compromise through Kickstarter. And when you see it that way, you go, you know, this isn't, it's not like somebody is getting a lot of people to like kind of finance it. it basically, it's kind of like pre sales. When I was a kid, I lived in the tropics and I would order stuff from the backs of comic books and stuff, you know, and it would take forever to get there. And every one, even if you're in the US and say, you know, you have to allow six weeks for shipping. Yeah. Because basically you were ordering and they would get all the orders and then they would produce as many as the orders came in. So you were pre buying. And that's, in a way, that's what Kickstarter is, in a way. But I think it's really about getting a, getting, I don't know, I don't want to say community, because that's kind of an IT kind of, mm -hmm. kind of la-di-da type of thing. But it's like getting your market, getting the people who might be interested, and they get to know about it. And in a way, I think the great thing about this Blood Island kind of Kickstarter um, comic is that you, you're you kind of already kind of getting some interest for what we hope will end up being a movie. Right. But if it doesn't, you're going to get a damn cool Tiki mug. Yes. So I got one. Let, let me ask you like, about of course, of course, I like the green one with the blood. Of course. Touches. And, 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 and you know, that's knowing, that, I knowing like. that you like the green one because of your <laughs> reanimator roots, let me ask you the magic question that I'm sure a lot of people want to know, especially with your history with them. Is there a chance if it goes to a movie, if it might have Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton in it? <laughs> well, well, maybe we should... Maybe we should include them. You right? should. Yeah, hey, you this, should. This movie, I'm telling you, if we get to make it, the thing that excites me about it is it's just, you know, it's not one of these message first horror movies. Uh -huh. right? I must say that in the last 20 years, I've been, it's been harder and harder to get too excited about horror yeah. because it's become a medium for people who really aren't that interested in the genre. Right. You know, they're just, they're, for better or for worse, they, what they want is an entree into the movie. And the horror movies start being, it's kind of like message first. It's like it's a social commentary. It's, and you kind of go, God, can we just not have a thrill park ride, you know, a theme park ride, or, you know, can we just not have a fun horror movie? Yeah. Right. Of course, this began, I think, with uh, with the beginning of the modern era of horror, which was Night of the Living Dead. Yes. Um, and George Romero, the Night of the Living Dead was such a huge effect on, on horror, um, not... Uh, I mean, to a great degree, because it, he screwed up the copyright. It was, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> he lost out on that one. Yeah. That, that big, that's a big big thing. A big, big thing. It wouldn't be near as, as well known now You're if right. the copyright had been protected. Yeah. But it was, of course, he was shooting in Pittsburgh, and he was using the people he knew. 
And so we have this black kind, he wasn't the protagonist, but he's one of the main characters. And he was totally wrong for the whole movie, of course, because he, you know, remember the white racist wanted to go in the basement to hide out. Yeah. And the black guy didn't want to. And eventually they all get killed. The black guy goes hides out in the basement and survives until the racist sheriff or the jingoistic sheriff kind of plugs them. Yeah, right now, and yeah. you know, back then you didn't see black characters on that level. Yeah. But it, I, but I've talked to the people involved with that movie and, and George Romero, who was very involved, right? He directed it. And that wasn't what they were thinking. Right. And then when they did, did, um, they, um, Dawn of the Dead, all of a sudden it was in a mall. And they had the people shopping, which was funny. And it was a horror movie. But all of a sudden it seemed like it was making some kind of a commentary right. on, on, on society. And I think after a while, you know, all these, you know, it was so successful that now the critics start kind of thinking, well, it can't be successful just because it's a horror movie. Because yeah. horror movie, horror is like, like one step above porno, right? It's, it's not <laughs> it is, it is. And we made that analogy. And then he does, by the time he did Day of the Dead, he was believing his press. Yeah. And everything was like self-consciously, except for the, except for the effects, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that has just evolved, just the way the singer songwriter, the, um, you can hear, I'm in Holly, right? So you hear the sound, the, the sound of the night, right? Yeah. <laughs> the siren. Um, but anyway, I think then we get to the point where we're doing all these horror movies that are all about, it's all about what political or There's always some or kind of an agenda. Commentary yeah, there's some it. kind of an agenda behind it. There's, there's nothing wrong with just going, and we've talked about that before, there's nothing wrong with just going back to the old days where there's a monster and the monster does bad things, not because he has an agenda, because he's a monster, and that's it. <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll and you know, you. the thing is, if you do anything, uh, and let's say in a creative way, right? You write a story, write a song, make a short film, whatever. Whatever you do, if you just do it, it's going to reflect the times that you're in. Yes. Yeah, it will reflect them, just like Night of the Living Dead. It just, just reflected that era. But it's different when the message is forward. It's like, it's about, you know, if you do something like Get Out, it's all about the message. Right. It's about the cultural message. Yeah. And Get Out's a good movie, I think. But I would prefer to see, you know, The Cabin in the Woods. Yeah. Which is just a pure, a pure kind of, indulgent in the genre. Well, and I think, and I that think that's where, that's where I, that's where I stand. I like, I like the movie to just be an exploitative commercial fun ride. Yes. And of course it's going to reflect the era we're in. We don't have to make a Trump monster. You know what I mean? We don't have <laughs> that's to already make been the done. Bad guys. We don't have to make the bad guys be People we don't agree with right. politically. You know, you're, you're, do definitely, you're definitely, you're definitely old wants school. To do that. Right. Political stuff is better in sci-fi movies. Yes. Right. Sci-fi movies almost generally deal with that, but horror generally is about love, sex, yes. death, um, psychology. You know, demonology. Right. You know, it's 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 better if it's not dealing with kind of our cultural commentary. I think. Yes. Well, even, even though it, even though Night of Living Dead turned out political, like you said, 
they didn't think of it that way. You remind me an awfully lot of George Romero because I knew George pretty well, and, and you're that same type of person, you know. And and you that's mean old? Point. Well, <laughs> aren't we? Aren't we all? Certain era. You know, I don't know if like you guys saw no this. Problem. But, but, I get it. Considering your considering <laughs> your partner's connections. You know, uh, AMC Rainbow, who owns Shutter, they've got some really big pockets, and it would really be worth their while to invest in this movie because then they might wind up being able to show it on Shutter. Have you ever approached them for financing? Oh yeah, quit, quit. You know, I go, I make all the rounds. Okay. <laughs> the thing is, I'll be, the thing is, is that as you get older, um. You're not really taken very seriously. I mean, I'm, ah, for sure. You, you will, you will find, you will find, you will find that out, right? Yeah. It's not a big, it's not a secret, but until you get there, you don't realize how little you count yeah. as you get older. And I don't know what it's like in ten years, right? Yeah. But, but no, I've been around. You know, the thing is, is I left. The U.S. I left L.A. for about 15 years and worked in Europe and in Asia. And um, when I and then I came back after the big kind of Great Recession. And when I came back, of course, everything changed because I grew up. I began during the video revolution, right. right, which was a great time for independence, the 80s. And then it kind of got monopolized, and you ended up with Blockbuster, who was the Netflix of their era. Right, right? it sure was. And then the broadband got big enough to put movies on it. I mean, the music business got hit first in the right. 90s. Which they don't have, it's music, you don't need that much bandwidth. And in the 2000s, all of a sudden, they, it started being possible to put movies online. Now, the movies, we could, I mean, they're, they're cable series, you know, um, and they're, they're, some of them are, I mean, cable series are, fan, some of them are fantastic, I guess, but the movies are different, and I think that we're, you know, everything's evolving. When I came back to LA, all of a sudden I realized that, um, I was the old guy. I was always the oldest guy in the room. And people say, oh, no, no, you had experience and all that. I said, believe me, when I made Reanimator, I didn't look for the old guy to work with. The guy who reminded me of my dad. I didn't want my dad in the room. I wanted the people like me. So just because I feel like I shouldn't be treated that way. I'm going, I'm going into pitch to people who are younger than my kids. Yeah. You know, you really should see there, there's a movie. Totally different. Right. Right. So as you get older, the best thing you can do is own stuff. You really should see there's and, a, a and movie. And if you're on. in the movie business, you should own IP. Right. Right. Because if you don't own anything, you're just old and in the way, and people don't want someone that reminds them of their parents. You really should see a movie. And I, I get it. I get right. it. You know, you really should see a movie that's on Shutter right now, of all places to mention. Uh, that was George Romero's last film, and it was a commentary on getting older and how society. Uh, treats you and doesn't take you serious. He did a whole thing. What was that called? It's called the amusement park. The amusement park. You should look that he up. Actually, oh, really? I yeah. haven't heard of that. He actually shot it. He actually shot it in the seventies, but it never got finished or it never got released. Oh, okay. And they, they okay. Shutter actually just brokered some deal with George's family. They found it and they basically restored it and put it on. So oh, yeah. it, it's it very much kind of like his his roots, where it was more like industrial filmmaking, but it, it is very um, political as far as talking about uh, how society deals with ageism. Well, you know, it, you've got to hand it to him that he just stuck it out in Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. You know, he just he did it his way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, unfortunately. He ended up having 
to just end his career making more and more of permutations of Night of Living Dead, yeah. which I'm sure was a big disappointment. But hey, at least he had something to do on that. Well, I did. I was lucky enough to to go to um, the screening. I think it was the first ten or fifteen minutes of. of I'm trying to remember. Was it called Diary of the Dead Diary or something? Of the Dead, yeah. And and it was a midnight show at the Cannes Film Festival. And on the red carpet at the Palais. And I and there was a party at a yacht at Cannes. They had these parties at yachts and stuff. And I got to talk to him there and go up the red carpet with that crew and see those 15 minutes and it was really great because well it wasn't like he was in competition yeah you know it wasn't it wasn't like he but it was a kind of an acceptance mm -hmm. an international and kind of cinema acceptance of i think what he was doing and i did i did get to have time talking to him at the Sechez Film Festival in Spain and about about his movies. And I really feel like, you know, there's this this something that people that people like to say about how Night of the Living Dead was kind of based on I Am Legend, mm -hmm. the Richard Matheson. Right story, which I've read, I think it's great, all that. And even George Romero um, kind of almost up front would go, yes, yes, I, you know, I based it on that. And I think it's a, I think it's wrong. I think, yeah, there's, there's something, you know, and yeah, we all have our inspirations. But I kind of get the feeling that he was beaten up a little bit about that. He was, and yes. I don't think it's—I don't think it's justified, not no, at all. No, I, most people haven't even read the damn story. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know I mean, I mean, you ask people, have you read it? Did you really read it? You know, yes, there's something to it, but it's *Night of the Living Dead* is a zombie. You know, of course, vampires and zombies are basically the same. They're two sides of the same coin, of course. And I think um, Anne Rice showed us that with Interview with the Vampire mm -hmm. when she had the vampire go to Eastern Europe looking for his antecedents. And he found them in the graveyard, a ghoul kind of eating dead flesh. Right. And he was disgusted. They're zombies. And then he went to Paris to the theater where the zombies, there were the gay zombies and they were, and they had taste and they only drank the blood. So zombies and vampires, I think are really part of the same thing. So the idea that I am legend is about zombies and, you know, Night of the Living Dead. I mean, I am, I am legend is vampires. You know, I, yeah. I never really thought of Reanimator as being a zombie film, but in your press release, it mentioned it as a zombie film. Is it a zombie film? Did it? I don't know. I think it's kind of a mad doctor thing. Yeah, right? yeah, there's yeah. more so. But, you yeah. know, when you bring somebody back to life, when you bring somebody back to life, that's a zombie. Right? Yeah. In a way? Technically. Yeah, a reanimated, a reanimated subject, yeah. a living dead, yeah. a... You know, I think that's, but it is kind of a Frankenstein thing because there's a scientist. Yeah. And that's Frankenstein. And of course, with Bride of Frankenstein, a Bride of Reanimator, we went full on yeah. with the Mary Shelley kind of routine. So let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, ask you the let me ask you the magic question. Stuart, unfortunately, is gone. Uh, Charlie Band and his people are still around. If, if Charlie Band approached you, to do another reanimator film now that Stewart is gone, would you be involved? 
Charlie is very tricky to deal with. That I know, yes. <laughs> yeah. We've you heard gotta that. Be, you got to be very careful. you got to be careful. I did see him just last week, actually. I went to the um, memorial to Stuart uh-huh. after a year and a half of, um, you know, because of COVID. Right. And it was really kind of a moving event. It was that they, the Scanso Garden in Pasadena, and Charlie was there also with, I think his son was with him, and his girlfriend, and, and Rick Band, right. who I've been in touch with for many years. I've worked with him. And, um, and you know, I had a big lawsuit against Charlie. I deposed him and all this kind of stuff. Because it was, you know, it was like I had everything I owned on the line. Right. But I still, you know, part of me would just love to work with Charlie. Because I just, when I came to L.A., I just, when I went to one of his sets, I, I knew his father before I knew him. Right. Right. Albert, and he was producing Sword Kill. This movie, this movie about a samurai swordsman that he got frozen in Alaska or, or Siberia or something and ends up in LA, you know. And, um, I just loved what Charlie was doing. I loved it. It was, and I got involved, you know. And it was, to me, it was like when I was in junior high school or middle school, I think they call it now, um, and I saw those Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe movies like Pit and Pendula, Premature Burial, and Tales of Terror. And that was, to me, was like, wow. Or the, um, you know, the, in the 50s, the, the, um, you know, the House on Haunted Hill, yeah. the Tingler, the 13 Ghosts. They, I mean, these are the movies that are Harry House, and those are the movies I wanted to make. Yeah. And Charlie was doing it. He was, he was doing it. And he was my age, you know. And it was, I just thought it was great. The problem was, is that his business practices sometimes right. makes it difficult to work with them. Right. It, it, you know, that's the problem. If Charlie kind of was a little strayer with his business, I think he would own a he would own a studio by now. Oh, today are there any studios? I call them platforms. Right. It's <laughs> yeah. true. David Searing David Searing calls them utilities. Yeah. He says there's no David Searing says there, and he he his career was in in that he said no nah, they're just utilities now. Yeah. They oh, just yeah. they just provide the access. We, we, we've, heard, we've, heard a lot of, we've heard a lot of similar stories about Charlie Band, including from Ken Hall, uh, who wrote <laughs> one of his best movies and said, I'll be in the studio at your place with anybody, except I will not be in the same room with Charlie Band. But, uh, <laughs> either love him or hate him, you know, he does produce. And, and he, we get well, there's a lot of people. I think as long as, you know, I used to tell people, say, oh, you know, you think I should do, I take my movie to Charlie or something and say, just don't get involved with financing or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, but if he's, if you're doing something and he's going to pay you, the worst that can happen is he doesn't pay you. You know, but you get a movie made. And quite frankly, I don't know. I mean, Charlie is a tremendously talented guy. Yes. In, way. And he just keeps burning bridges, burning bridges until he's making I don't know kind of pot movies or something. Yeah. But he could have, I mean, honestly his I think his level I mean, he's unique, I think and he's like the Corman, you know except that, of course, Corman got, you know nobody ever Corman said, I'm not going to pay you anything, and he didn't pay him anything. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Charlie reminds you that it's That's show. Okay. Charlie reminds you that it's show business. He yeah. sees the business side of. of and, you know, yes. people. You know, when, before I came out to L.A., I was living in North Carolina, and I made kind of an amateur movie there. And I real this is way back when this was uh-huh. in the seventies, and I realized that you couldn't back then. Today, you could make a movie anywhere. Um, and I work with people who are making no budget movies all over the U.S. because I, with my partner, John Penny, who, uh, we have a company that we do producers rep. We help people make these no budget movies and try to find a way to get it distributed and to make some money on it, get the money back, right? Um, but back when I was, back in the 70s, it was none of that. It was, you couldn't, you know, nobody knew how to make movies. Nobody would show up. That's the problem with amateur movies, is nobody shows up when they're supposed to. But I think that um, that when I saw what Charlie was doing, it was like, wow, this is the real deal. You know, he's the real deal. Okay, whatever his... You know, whatever his weakness is, of course, that kind of killed him. Yeah. But I think he could have, I mean, I loved working with him. I just thought he was, I just, I mean, he's just so, he's, he's ahead of the curve yeah. all the well, time. You had the, you had the situation. Now, I, lo- I lost a lot of money. Right. You had a situation. I mean, I lost a tremendous amount of money. You had a situation with put Charlie. That, put that aside. Yeah. Put it aside. Yeah. And go, okay, forgetting that, that's not Corman, because everybody that works with Corman is still happy with Corman. Yeah. Right. You know? Corman paid people. You always thought he did, but everybody told me they got paid. So if I he guess, said he was going to pay not, He said, I'm not going to pay you much. Yeah. And he didn't. Yeah. Right. But he did pay. But he did pay. Yeah. So that's, that, yeah, so I don't, you know, the thing is, is that, I think you got to separate the business of Charlie Band from the talent and the vision of Charlie Band. And I think the talented vision is, I don't know, he's one of the original. So uh, aside, aside, the great. aside from the lawsuit that you got involved with with Charlie, that part of you that, that likes to and would like to work with Charlie, do you think you could? You, you know, you kind of hinted you might, but... Um, I like it. Okay, well, I'm that's a good sure answer. it could be possible. What kind of relationship did Charlie I mean, have? the thing about... The, pardon? What kind of relationship did Charlie have with Stewart? What does Stewart think of Charlie Band? I think... Well, Stewart... I'm not sure. Um, Stewart... I mean, when I was working with Stewart at one point when I was suing Charlie or Empire um, I had to stop working there because I had an office over there yeah. and um, and we were working on robot jobs mm-hmm. and at one point I just had to go well you know I, I can't really keep doing this but I had a deal to make to make Dagon in Wales in England, and Stewart bailed on it, which of course torpedoed the deal. Yeah. And um, and he took me to made a bunch of movies with him. Of course, at the same time, Stuart and I worked on um, Honey and Shrunk the Kids, and I mean, Stuart and I kept working together um, throughout. And but Stewart got to make a he was able to make a bunch of movies with Charlie. Right. And I think with Stewart all he he never put any money up, see. That's the difference. Yeah, that's a big and difference. And I think Charlie always paid him. I think he did. I don't know. I have no idea. But see I was involved in the bit in business with Charlie. Right, right. That's the difference. Yeah. Now I don't know about Kent Hall or those guys. Yeah. Charlie did I guess maybe they say he didn't pay him and all that. And yeah. Certainly, I had that experience, and 
but I think with Stuart, I think he always did, but he made all these movies. Stuart just wanted to make his, his movie. Right. So he did a bunch of movies with Charlie when I wasn't all Robot Jocks, which I started on, but then I left. And which was a very big, complicated movie. And then I think he did like Castle Freak and um, Pit and the Pendulum. Right. And I'm not sure if he had another one. Was there another? Mm, I'm not, not sure. positive I'm right sure. now. I'm blanking. Was there only those two, really? I thought there was another one. There probably was more, but I just, I'm, I'm blanking right now. Yeah. Mm. Well, let me ask you as we as we wrap up here, though, Brian, um, because we've talked to different people and some people like it, some people don't. This was one thing that that we did bring up with Romero a lot uh, is that no matter what he did or tried to do, and and true fans know that he did more than just zombie films. He was always the guy that was known for the zombie film. Yeah. Let well, me, he did. He did. Uh, he did Night Rider. Right. Right. He did, he what did, was the carnival one? The did, circus one. What something was something wicked this way comes? No, no. No, that, that's no, no, no. But he did he did, he did do that. He did there was one that he did like it was called like Sideshow or something. He did the monkey one. He did, and Martin. did Martin. Martin. Yeah. Martin. I love Martin. And then he had his big one that was right on the edge of going over, which is called the Dark Half. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Stephen King movie. And that one that was the one that I feel like maybe he was a bit impinged upon the studio yeah. or by the material, but it was all, that one almost could have been a huge hit if it changed its career completely. Right, but kind of putting the, the question towards you, I mean, you've done so much. You've written, produced, directed, you know, films that I think should probably get more acclaim, like Society, and things like that, but you're always, of course, known for Reanimator. How do you feel about that? Um, well, I'm glad that I'm glad I have something that people <laughs> still like. You know? No, I wish that I, of course, I wish I had had a bigger career in the movie. But you know, there there is kind of an there's a when I was worried about what my friends were doing and people who were doing much bigger projects than we, me, I only was concerned about it when I wasn't working on something. Mm -hmm. right. The minute I was on a movie, it was all gone. You're just on your movie. It's only when you're not making a movie that you can even look around and try to measure yourself against others. But I think that um, when I started as someone who didn't think about going into the movies until he was in his 30s, right. back in a time when people didn't do I just thought when I first did my amateur film, I thought, wow, I had done a lot of jobs and a lot of little businesses. I thought, wow, if you could make a living making movies, how cool is that? I mean, I you did. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I did make a living at it. <laughs> but I didn't know about the big time, right? Uh, in, in addition so to Maybe the... I should have thought, I want the big time. Yeah. And then maybe I would have... But you've got to be able to know what that is. Right. I didn't know. I had no idea... I didn't go to film school. I didn't go to the AFI. I didn't, you know, I was like a hippie, a dropout in commune communities, taking way too much LSD. And, <laughs> and then I had to make a living because the revolution didn't come. Right. So I was a carpenter and when I was, had an art supply store and, you know, and I had a bar and, it was kind of like, how do you make a living now? And then you go, oh, you mean you can make a living coming up with story <laughs> and shooting movies? And right. So now, I said, I want to do that. In, in addition but, to, to so Blood I'd Island. So I say, be careful what you wish right. for. 
In addition to Blood Island, we're certainly looking for the Blood Island thing to be coming out with the tiki mugs and all that. But uh, are you working on other projects? I heard you had some other movies coming up, too, for other people. Well, I'm working on a society cable series. Oh, nice. We'll see. Very nice. That's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like the lottery. Hey, society was, in Europe, it actually was quite well received. Yeah. But here in the U.S., it was like a total embarrassment. And then all of a sudden, 20 years later, it developed an audience. That's and now it's like I get as much, I get as much um, kind of interest coming for society as I do with reanimated movies, go. all three of them. And you kind of go, hey, who knows? You, you're ugly, the ugly duckling becomes a swan. Who yeah. knows, right? Tell that and man would. <laughs> maybe that'll happen. I've yeah. I've been trying to get a cable series for like more years than I want to say yeah. because I kind of look at it I think cable series are kind of like cooler than movies right now yeah. because they just they just seem like more in the right guys and they're like a real long form you know and I keep going why don't I have one oh right I'm old <laughs> <laughs> or I'm not talented enough or I'm not it's connected enough and something like that but then, and also, I'm negotiating right now for yet another reanimator sequel. Oh, you are? Okay. <laughs> so we'll see, you know. We'll see. See, it, it was my I intuition. really love to do. Pardon? It was my intuition. I had a feeling you might have been. <laughs> you know, you keep beating a dead horse to finally get stuff and you can ride it. You know? I, but I'm really excited about the um, the Tales of Blood Island yes. because I feel like that's a little bit retro original. Yeah. Nobody's doing it. And I just feel like it could just be like pedal to the metal, like full on genre, just pure fun. You know, with no With no expectation. Absolutely. Well, uh, Brian, I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with us. And I encourage our listeners, because we do want to see this Blood Island thing happen, uh, head over to the Kickstarter campaign. Just go to Kickstarter, Kickstarter's website and just look up Blood Island, or you can do a search for Brian's name, and it should pop right up. Uh, some very cool promos and, and re uh, rewards that you can get over there, the comic book, the tiki mug, all of that good stuff. Even some advanced, uh, before it comes out, copies of things. Uh, depending on what level you want to support the uh, campaign at. And uh, Brian, I thank you so much, not only for spending time with us and wish you the best of luck with this Blood Island project, but also because it's nice to just talk to somebody whose heart is in horror and isn't interested in necessarily, like we talked about, it having an agenda. You just want to get back to the monster movies just because that's what's good. And you know something? Kelly Maroney's right. You are awesome. <laughs> You're awesome for sure. <laughs> Kelly Maroney was, was totally right. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. And oh, well, let me, before before we go, let me ask you, is there any place directly that fans can go? Do you have a website or a Facebook or anything like that where they can uh, get in contact? Or I've, got, I've, got an, I've got an Instagram. I've awesome. got a Facebook, but I don't check it much. But the Instagram is, is active. Very cool. So, so go over and follow Brian over on Instagram as well. And then Brian, keep in touch. We'd love to have you come back on to promote, you know, the next step with Blood Island or any other projects that you have coming up. Our door is always open to you. Thanks a lot. It was a, a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Bye -bye. Thank you, Brian. Have a great rest of your weekend. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Hi, I'm Brian Usna, producer of Reanimator, director of Society, and maker of just a lot of weird horror movies. I want to tell you about my latest weird tale. It's actually a comic book. It's called Tales of Blood Island, based on the classic features shot in the Philippines in the 1960s, and it's tiki horror all the way. Weird monsters, 
cliffhanger endings drawn by the amazing Steven Sestilli. Tales of Blood Island comic is a prelude to a movie series as wild, maybe crazier, with more monsters than you can shake a stick at from the South Pacific. But before we do the movies, we need your help to fund the comic. We support this. We have lots of cool swag to get. The comic books, of course. Blood Island shirt. Tiki bar stuff. Tiki mug. If you're a fan of tiki horror, tiki bars, tiki drinks, tiki mugs, or just an old-fashioned horror fan, this zombie's for you. Now you can see it all at your local theater in Beast of Blood. And on the same show, Curse of the Vampires, both brand new in gory color. You'll see a mad fiend transplant human heads in the Cave of Horrors and encounter stunning, screaming, shocking terror as it lives. A monster's head detached from its body, causing savage and inhuman destruction. More fantastic than science, more shocking than fantasy, the creature without a head controlled by an insane artificial brain, Beast of Blood. <laughs> See the Bloodorama Shock Festival, if you dare. Activate the artificial head.
the day may come soon.